Good morning. Our call to worship this morning is from our passage, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. Would you stand together with me as we sing, I sing the mighty power of God. Scripture reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, the first eight verses. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 8. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, and immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this, as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven, so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Take time to be holy. Oh, I'm sorry. Work for the night is coming. Fooey. This will be fun. All right. through the 
sunny noon Fill brightest hours with labor Rest come sure and soon Give every flying minute Something to keep in store Work for the night is coming When man works no For the night is coming under the sunset skies. While their bright tints are glowing, work for daylight flies. Work till the last beam fadeth, fadeth to shine no more. Work while the night is If you take your bulletins, we'll look at the announcements found inside as I find my way back to where I once was. Uh, this evening at 6 o'clock, evening service, deacons, don't forget, 445 in my office uh, before that, so 445 deacons meeting. Uh, six o'clock evening service downstairs. We're collecting food for our Thanksgiving baskets today and next Sunday, and that's it. Uh, so if you have canned or dried goods, uh, please leave them in the black box in the foyer. Uh, we're glad for that opportunity and so grateful for how everybody participates in that. Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock is Ladies Bible Study. Thursday night at 7 at our regular time this year, this week, is prayer meeting. Pilgrim Homeschool Group Friday morning at 10. Naomi Ladies will be here at the church Friday evening at 7 o'clock. On Sunday, the 26th, we're going to have communion in the morning service. Uh, and also be reminded, Missions Committee, we have a Missions Committee meeting before the evening service. Uh, so if you could meet downstairs at 445 on the 6th, that would be wonderful. On the 12th would be Men's Fellowship Breakfast. We had a terrific time, good food and good uh, Bible study yesterday. Glad for it. On the 20th, we're going to have our family Christmas, a celebration of Christ's birth. And uh, we need singers, and we need children to dress up for the nativity, so uh, please talk to Kim and Kareth about that. We'd love to have your participation. You see the nursery and children's church schedules there, and we thank you, uh, ladies and, sorry, children's church, gentlemen, uh, for your help downstairs. Uh, it's a great blessing. A huge thank you to those folks who helped rake leaves for our elderly yesterday. Angela, Ellie, Abby, Elaine, Tina, Georgia, Shelley, Maggie, Julie, Clayton, Jamie, Madison, Noah, Wendy, Brianna, Joyce, Bob, and Paul, uh, otherwise known as the Dream Team. We got a boatload done. It was wonderful. And uh, very glad for everybody that came out. Uh, we had a lot of fun doing it. And um, we were able to take care of uh, Judy's neighbor. I pray that's a good uh, testimony and uh, helps with witness there. They even came and helped me a little bit, and I'm very glad for that. And uh, it was a wonderful day yesterday, and uh, we praise the Lord for the opportunity. At this time, Sharon, Tammy, Elaine, and Jackie are going to come and minister in song.
Amen. Thank you for that wonderful reminder and song, ladies. We appreciate it. Children are dismissed to junior church at this time. The rest of us are headed to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning at verse 6. As you're heading there, uh, I'll share a little college story, and I'll tell you why in a minute, because it's, I kind of feel the same problem, uh, although the stakes are just wildly different. Uh, I was in J-Suite of Schaefer dorm. That's the third floor. Our dorms, the, the downstairs was mostly like a walkout basement on a hillside. And then the second floor was pretty normal, and then third floor was up there. I was on the side of the building, so it was kind of like two and a half stories to the ground. It was winter time. There was a lot of deep, powdery snow, so that affected my choice. Uh, but we had these heavy, heavy solid wood doors, and they were set in metal frames, heavy you know, steel frames. And the guys in the hallway could do what they called a penny jam, where they'd literally take pennies, and they'd wedge them in between that heavy door and that heavy door frame. And even no matter what you did with your door lock, you couldn't open your own door from the inside. You were stuck. Uh, it wouldn't unlatch, unlatch because it was in there too tight. And so some fellows did that, and they were pretty proud of themselves. And they captured us in our room on the third floor. And they were out there laughing and having a good old time and talking about another of their favorite tricks. Kids under a certain age, you'll have to ask your parents or grandparents uh, what an LP record was, uh, but uh, those were all around back in my day. They got, actually by the time I was done in college, they were, you know, pretty much gone, but um, they would fill those with talcum powder, slide it under the door and stomp it, and it'd make such a cloud in your room you couldn't breathe. And they had done that to a friend of mine in another dorm. And so my roommate, who was six foot five plus and had long, long arms, he said to me, we need to go out the window before they do it. We got to get out of here. I said, yeah, I'm with you. Let's do it. So we found out we tied all of our sheets together. Taught a good, I did a good square knot. I was telling you, Paul, I, that's about the only one I remember is a good square knot. So I tied our sheets with square knots. We tied it in the metal frame of my roommate's bunk, and we put it crosswise in the window. And then he went over first. It wasn't it nice to me to let him go first. And um, remembering that he's six foot five and has very long arms. And... None of those are true. Neither of those statements is remotely true of me. Um, also, the shape of the, of the dorm, the top floor looked like a chalet where it was not quite vertical. It had a little pitch to it, and it was wood shakes. And so my window was in an alcove in a hole in those wood shakes. And so Tad went down, and his feet, he says, this is perfect, Nate. Uh, I re my feet reach the sill of the second floor window. I'm going to jump right off of this into the snowbank. It's not bad. This is perfect. Do it just like I did it. I says, okay, fine, I will. So my first problem was, well, my ultimate problem was when I got down to where his feet were touching the windowsill, my feet were kicking glass because they weren't remotely close to that windowsill. I didn't have anywhere near the reach that he did. Uh, but before that, I got myself kind of in no man's land because the slant of that roof up there, I had my hands where if I put my, you know, hand over hand, if I put my hand as low as it needed to go, I was afraid it, my weight was going to jerk me and I was going to fall to the ground. And I couldn't, I just didn't see any other way around it. So I actually climbed back in and then switched hands and came back down, kind of baby stepping my hand over hand. And uh, it was nice. It, there was probably three feet of snow, which, which cushioned everything. And I'll never forget the look on the guy's face, faces when we came up behind them uh, when they were outside my door still plotting no good. Uh, but I'm in that no man's land with this passage. Where, where I don't know if I tackle the whole thing, I'm going to be too quick at it. I'm not sure how to divide it into two. So we're going to see. This might be part one of two, and we might get through all of it. And I don't plan to keep you here crazy late, so we'll see where the Lord takes us. Uh, this is one of essentially three passages in the New Testament that talk about church discipline. So part of what we're going to do today is we're going to talk in the broad scheme about church discipline, what is it, why it matters, and so forth. And we're going to talk about our attitude in it, our process, really four passages, I should say, uh, with Galatians 6 mixed in. So we're going to talk about church discipline, but also, in this case, it had everything to do with idleness. And so we're going to talk about the Christian and his work ethic as well. Uh, this passage addresses that. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll dig right in. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. 
Uh, please impress it upon our hearts. Help us, Lord, to take away from this uh, time in your word exactly what we need individually, uh, Lord, to live better for you, to honor you with our lives. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you would give us your wisdom and direction as we study together. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. So there is truth in its context. We read the scriptures in their context. We don't read the Old Testament as if it's the New Testament. We don't read before Christ passages like they're after Christ passages. We don't read you know, a passage to Gentiles as if it was written to Jews or vice versa. We have to understand there's a context. There's also an immediate context and application. And then there's one that there's a secondary where it might not have been written to us per se, but the truth stands true. Uh, there are several times where we see things that were said. We, we spent the last couple prayer meeting nights talking about Second uh, Chronicles 6 and 7. Second Chronicles 7, 14. America's all over our country are claiming it. It's popping up on Facebook all over the place. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek, seek my face and return from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will answer their prayer and I will heal their land. And so we want to put stars and stripes around that verse and we want to hug it tight. There's a truth in that verse that does apply to us, but the immediate context, God was writing that to his people, Israel, and he dealt with them as a chosen nation. As we've seen today, he deals with us as chosen individuals. And so there's a general principle there, but we are well to remember the actual context of it. This passage is... Uh, largely that way for us. Uh, he says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you receive from us. And so he's talking about unruliness. And today it's mostly in regard to work, er, their work ethic and to gossip are two major sins that are addressed in this passage. Uh, the nature of... of, of not working and being a busybody and becoming a gossip, it's the nature of certain sins that they tend to lead right into other sins naturally. We've got to be very careful about that. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get there. There is an imperative for purity in God's church. So I read a kind of a heavy passage for scripture reading this morning. The situation in Corinth was there was a man who was actually having an affair with his stepmother, his father's wife. And the big problem, he doesn't address the man directly. He addresses the church for allowing the man to stay in the church like nothing's wrong. It's generally believed that they had this warped idea of grace where they could hear about gross immorality. He says, this is stuff the, the Gentiles wouldn't even talk about this. This is, this is, you know, just verboten. They wouldn't talk about this. But you're allowing it. What's more, you're proud. You're puffed up. What they're saying is, oh, isn't it grace wonderful? Why, that man's living in terrible, gross sin, and it's all taken care of. It's all under the blood. Isn't it great? And Paul scolds him in no uncertain terms. You should grieve. You should pray. You should pray for that man, and in the meantime, until he gets right with you, he needs to be out of the church. It, it's not, and we're going to look at it as we go, church discipline is not punitive, it's corrective. The idea is, putting someone out of the membership of the church, and incidentally, most passages that, that talk about local church membership, it's in the context of discipline. A lot of what membership is, is you and I making each other accountable, one to another, corporately. Uh, each of us is accountable to the church at large as the body of Christ, and that's how it ought to be. And so, Galatians chapter 6 says, Brothers, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, you, you born-again folks with the Spirit inside, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. In other words, we have a responsibility to correct an erring brother who's in a gross sin. It's not for every little sin. I remember college days when the freshmen learned this in class, and they came picking at all of us for every little thing we ever did. That, that's not the intention. The idea, if it's a sort of sin that's really reflecting poorly on the church at large, Clear, obvious, unrepentant immorality usually is what's involved, although we'll see in our passage there's more to it than that. He says, you've got to get it out. The first priority is the purity of the church. The purity of the church. 
the protection of the sheep, especially the little sheep. You grow up in a church that says an affair with your stepmother is no big deal. What's your view of morality going to be? It's not going to be good at all. And so in that passage in 1 Corinthians, he lays it out and he tells them, you know, uh, put him out until he stops what he's doing. He tells them later, by the way, that when the man repents, when he stops doing what he's doing, welcome him back with open arms. This is not forever. This is until he gets this right with the Lord. We see it in Scripture. There's evidence in 2 Corinthians that this man gets right with the Lord. And Paul says, hey, hug him. You know, welcome him back. Open arms. Uh, we've seen it in experiences as, as a church. I've seen it in several different churches through the years where people went through the process of church discipline and they humbled themselves and they got it right and they came back into full fellowship and praise the Lord for it. That's the goal. Where churches get in massive trouble is when they see it as punitive. I'll show you. We're going to punish you, punish you, punish you. It's restorative. It's not punitive. And we've got to be so careful of ourselves, Galatians 6. In a spirit of meekness, it says, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. My dad tells a story of when he was a young pastor in Indiana. There was a pastor in the fellowship that fell into sexual immorality and the, one of the pastors who made the most noise condemning the first man, he was the next man to get into trouble. It's a fellowship like ours. It's very, very rare to, very rare to have that happen. And here's two men, and the one man who made the most noise about it, he's the one who fell into it next. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Satan has a sense of humor. He also knows how to get a good bang for his buck. And if he can take the chief accuser and get him to stumble next, He's all over that. He gets a lot of mileage. So be careful. Um, 1 Corinthians 5. Uh, Matthew 18 is another passage that we need to look at briefly because Matthew 18 is, is the bridge between corporate church discipline as a membership and how I deal with people personally. Matthew 18, verse 15. If your brother sins, this is, uh, most versions say against you, that's the sense of it, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. So here's the first thing. It, the, the onus to act, the responsibility for action is not on the offending party, it's on the offended party. So somebody hurts your feelings, somebody says something hurtful to you or about you, uh, you're supposed to go talk to them about it, and you're only supposed to go talk to them about it. This goes to our point about busybodying and gossiping. Uh, here in a few minutes if we get there um, but the point is you go to the person with whom you have the issue not to somebody else but what's human nature human nature goes right back to high school and junior high and you go to all your friends and can you believe what she said to me can you believe that and everybody you want people on your side and so you can turn around and say hey I got an army with me that's kind of the mental process isn't it but biblically talk privately with the person who offended you privately so you don't make it bigger than it already was or than it ever needs to be especially uh, I was taught by one of my uh, mentors in college about teaching deal with private things privately and public things publicly and I always found that to be good advice uh, but you go to the person who offended you and by the way part of the reason it's on you to go to them is because very often they're clueless about it uh, I don't have time to give further examples but I've had it in, in both ways where I've offended somebody and it was an innocent mistake and I had absolutely no idea that I'd hurt somebody's feelings and hurt them deeply and I tripped over myself when it was pointed out to me to make it right with them uh, I've also had people that did something that hurt me and they were just oblivious to it whether it was just carelessness or, or ignorance uh, sometimes people don't know and so the goal is you say hey you know what uh, you, you told the whole world that I was short and I'm sensitive about my height and you really hurt my feelings and I'm using something silly because let's not get real personal with true stuff, right? Uh, well, or too true of stuff. But um, point being, you go to that person and if they're like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know I hurt you. It wasn't my intention to hurt you. Or you know what, you misunderstood something. You ever hear half a conversation and jump to the wrong conclusion? Happens, doesn't it? And so that whatever the case, the two of you privately hash it out and you're friends again. That's how it's supposed to be. If he will hear you, you've gained your brother. 
verse 16, but if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that, and then he quotes, I believe it's Deuteronomy, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And so yourself plus another, that's two, plus another one, that would be three. Uh, that's my recommendation. Find somebody you both respect, a mutual friend uh, in Christian circles, a godly mutual friend that you both respect, and have them sit down with you and say, hey, would you repeat what you said to me? Or do you remember when I came to you about this and you told me to take a hike, long walk off a short pier, uh, or something like that? Well, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so is here with me just to establish what we're talking about. And again, the goal is if he hears you, that's it. If he refuses to listen to them, verse 17, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. That last verse is amazing, but what it basically means is this. God is saying to us as a local church and to our leadership, I have your back. If I lead you to participate and, and to actually practice church discipline, what you have decided down here, I'm going to back up in heaven. I have already backed up in heaven is actually how he words it. Um, I had two teaching opportunities in two different states and two different schools. In the one, I had no support whatsoever from the administration. The lunatics were running the asylum. I, stay, I, I finished my one-year contract and I got out of there as fast as I could. In the other one, I had the support of the administration. The administrator said to me, I will always support you in front of a parent or a, or a student. If I disagree with you, you're going to be right back in my office and we're going to talk. But I will always support you. I appreciated that. And I, I never made him go through that. I tried to be wise with him and uh, he was a wonderful mentor. And so Matthew 18, two of you alone, if that doesn't cut it, take a witness. If that doesn't cut it, go to the church. If that doesn't cut it, then the church excommunicates, hopefully in the temporary, like 1 Corinthians 5 uh, compared to 2 Corinthians, uh, hopefully in the short term. But that's that. But let's talk that through a little bit. Might it be that there are offenses that are too small for church discipline? I'll tell you there are. Um, I went to my pastor, a pastor I respected very, very much, and I told him about a terrible run-in I had with a Christian man from church. Uh, he had said horrible, hateful things to me. He had used language that you know, I, I work construction, I've heard it all, but to hear it inside my church being spoken of about one of the deacons in my church crushed me and broke my heart. And this man pretended to be a spiritual leader and I was dumbfounded. And I went to pastor about it and I gotta be honest, I went like, hey, what are you gonna do about him? Let him have it, you know? And pastor says, you know, I, I know some other people uh, that have had the same problem with that man and I'll give you the same advice I gave them, avoid him. Don't do business with him again. Just avoid him. Just, just quietly go your way and let him go his. And I walked out really disappointed. But then years later, I became a pastor. And the first time it came to me that two parties were, were uh, at odds with each other, it was really over Christian liberty and frankly not even a, a that important of one in either direction, I guess. I don't want to say anything more. But, but they differed, and the one of them wanted me to discipline the other one and kick him out of the church over what was basically a difference of conviction that sprouted from a difference of opinion. That's where passages like love covers a multitude of sins comes from. That's where 1 Corinthians 13, where it says love doesn't keep a list of wrongs suffered, that's where that comes into play. There are some times and some things where whether we try to use the pattern here in, in Matthew 18 or not, there are some things that we just have to let go in love. Many, many times, it's because maybe the Lord has brought us to a degree of spiritual maturity and the person who has offended us isn't at that maturity level yet. Their, their hair may be gray and your hair may not, but they're still not spiritually at that place. And so sometimes you just got to let it go. And sometimes, you know, the fact is there's imperfect people on both sides of every equation. And sometimes I have to pray, Lord, I don't know if I am at fault here. Whatever the case, Lord, will you judge it and will you work it out? Because I have to trust you for it, because I, for it, I don't know. We've got to be careful that way. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, moving along. 
in our passage. Uh, Paul's command in verse 6. Now we command you, brethren. This is not an urging and entreating, uh, suggesting. This is a command. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a command with Jesus' own authority behind it. This is a serious thing. This is a, a powerful, authoritative statement. Excuse me. The command itself was that they keep away from a brother in Christ who leads an unruly life. Uh, note that the first command was to those who weren't directly involved in the sin. It wasn't to the sinner, it was to those who were aware of the sinner. And he told them, stay away, avoid every brother who leads an unruly life. The greatest question I've had in this passage is the meaning of the word unruly. It's kind of interesting because it's only used three or four times in Scripture. It's all Paul, three times in, Thess in the Thessalonian epistles and once in Timothy. Uh, Paul's the only one who uses it. And unruly is it's the idea of, of not living by a set of rules, so it could mean misbehaving in any sense, not keeping the rules. But it, it typically has, the, in, in Paul's writing, it really seems to have the idea of an undisciplined life. This is a person who's just living without a care, living without conviction, living without an ethic, just living to please themselves. And frankly, as the passage unfolds, somebody who's just flat out lazy and not doing anything, not working at all. Um, and they're told, by the way, that this is a command from Christ. So if you're not the person who's involved in sin, but God says, don't be involved with that person involved with sin, you're directly disobeying God if you're having fellowship with somebody who's living in that kind of sin, with a Christian who's living in that kind of sin. Remember that in its context. The, uh, the end of our 1 Corinthians um, 5 passage, Paul says, I wrote you earlier not to keep company with fornicators, I didn't mean the fornicators of this world, and fornicator comes from the word pornea. It's the idea of any kind of sexual sin. It's an umbrella kind of a statement. He says, I didn't tell you to avoid anybody who's in any kind of immorality in the world at large. What I meant to say, what I, my point was, is anybody who calls themselves your brother or sister in Christ and lives an immoral lifestyle, you mark them and don't even have lunch with them until they get that right. That's what he's talking about. And he says, if, if you're not going to company with fornicators, idolaters, and he gives all this list of sinners, the different kinds of sinners, he says, you're going to have to leave the world. So here's how I would put it. If you're going to buy your gas someplace that doesn't have bad magazines, alcohol, gambling, as in the lotto, uh, and doesn't, you know, doesn't support any sinful thing, if you're going to buy your gas someplace that doesn't support any sinful thing, I don't know where you go. Not around here. That's the nature of it. And so it's the nature of our life, of our workaday world, and also of our witness, that we work amongst unsaved people that are living in sin. And in our world today, people don't, you know, morality is on hard times. It's been, you know, steadily downhill for the, the 52 years of my lifetime. It's been steadily, steadily downhill, but that's not to pretend it was any good before that. It's just gotten worse upon worse. And in the workaday world, nobody cares. But we can't choose to follow them. Our right isn't found in what is societally right. Our right is found in the pages of Scripture. What has God said? And so he spells it out. And so it's not my business if my neighbor is living in sin. But if a member of my church is living in sin, I can't avoid it. I am duty-bound by the Word of God, the command of Christ, to do something about it and to try to restore them uh, in a spirit of meekness. Um, so again, unruly is probably talking about laziness and a lack of a work ethic. Um, there's all kinds of scripture that talks about how hard we work. So he, he goes on here. Let me read through a little bit more. Keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you received of us. What tradition? For you yourselves know that you ought to follow our example because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you. We, we had good disciplines in our life. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so that you would follow our example. 
For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me, we talk about work ethic. There's so many passages. Uh, God's command to work came before the fall. We know that work got hard for man after the fall. By the sweat of your brow, you're going to eat. But he was put in the garden to, garden to tend it and to keep it. Uh, he, he wasn't just, you know, living on the beach and, and sipping from the coconut that somebody else handed him. He was to tend the garden and cultivate it and take care of it. Uh, Exodus and the giving of the um, Ten Commandments, and as it's explained further in ver chapter 23, a couple chapters later, six days you shall labor and do all your work. The seventh is holy to the Lord. You're to re not work in it, you're to rest on it. The Sabbath principle, we need both of those. We need the day of rest, the day of worship. Uh, we don't celebrate a Sabbath day as in the seventh day Saturday. Uh, we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, the first day of the week when Jesus was raised from the tomb. Uh, but as much as you can, give your Sunday to the Lord. As much as you can, rest with your Sunday. But the flip side of that is not OSHA approved. OSHA wants a 40-hour work week, five eight-hour days. And God's Word says, hey, you're going to work for six days. By the way, he's talking to farmers. And the fact is they got to do something on Sunday. That's the nature of the farm. Animals need to be fed, cows need to be milked, on and on it goes. Uh, but the idea was they had severe limits on what they were allowed to do, and they couldn't do anything more than what was absolutely necessary in the Jewish Sabbath. And so the idea is there are times where we have to do something. I kind of work every Sunday. Um, I enjoy it. So as Mark Twain says, find a job you love and never work a day in your life. That's how I feel studying Scripture and preaching it. Uh, I love it. Uh, but um, there are times where that gets bent in the modern world, but we need to keep that, that thought. And as we whine about, well, I only get two days off, well, great for you. Um, God said, have one day off. And so if you get another one, praise the Lord. Um, slothfulness is condemned in Proverbs 6, uh, verses 6 through 11. Go to the Anno, sluggard, observe her ways and be wise, which having no chief, officer, or ruler, prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. How long will you lie down, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Your poverty will come in like a vagabond and your need like an armed man. Uh, he says, look, you sluggard, you know, he's using two animals. He's using a slug, if you will, slow moving, slothful. And then he's using the ant. And the ant doesn't have a boss. It just works hard. Um, some of the, the nicest working environments I've ever had didn't have a hands-on boss. They just had good people who knew their job and loved to do it. Uh, that's a joy. That's the ant. Nobody tells it what to do, but it works. And it works because it knows the day is short and the weather's going to get bad and it lays up its food for that day. We need to watch the ant and learn from them. And we need to be very careful that a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest and our poverty comes in like a vagabond. Uh, our need like an armed man. Uh, industriousness is praised in Proverbs 31, uh, the virtuous woman. Um, I'm delighted at my house. My wife is an industrious woman. Um, it's hard to get her to slow down. I try. I really, truly do. Uh, but I would still rather have industriousness than someone that watched the world go around and waited on everybody else to take care of them. Uh, my wife's a wonderful example of that. Paul was continually on this, con this topic with them. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, verses 11 and 12, And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and to attend to your own business and work with your hands, just as we commanded you, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. If we take care of our business, is really what this passage is about. We carry our own weight. The scripture talks about... Uh, carrying our own weight. It also talks about bearing one another's burdens. This is a different word. It's help your brother or sister with their overwhelming burden that they can't carry. Help them with what they just can't do. First time I led wilderness camp at Camp Lamoka in western New York, 
I got there and I, it was a high school camp and they had made a bent, they had, they had bent things and it was junior high kids and they were all very, very small and slight. And so I had a plan that, that involved larger kids who could take a pack with more on their back and we were gonna split up who had the propane cans and who had this and that for the cooking and who had the food. And they had to send an EMT with me. There was another young man with me and he and I had to take twice as much in our packs as we planned on because those kids were never gonna carry what we had for them. They were way too little. So the purpose there is take care of your own weight, but look out for the others who might need a little help. And our church is so good about that, lifting each other up and ministering to each other's needs. We need to excel still more in it. That's the pattern of scripture. Um, he talked to uh, Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.8. He said that a man who doesn't work and provide for his family is worse than an unbeliever. Pretty strong words. Uh, we need to have a work ethic. We need to work with our own hands. We need to be busy about something so that we don't fall into traps. Uh, Paul gives his own example, uh, beginning at verse 7 uh, for, to verse 9. You, you know how you ought to follow our example because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you. So they had discipline in their lives. They got up at a decent hour. They didn't take a two-hour lunch break. They had discipline in their lives. Um, nor did we eat any man's bread without paying for it. We didn't just sponge off people. Um, in Christian school teaching, uh, it's, it's the poorest paying ministry in the world. It just is. It, it, they hardly pay you. It's the nature of it. Uh, public school teachers aren't typically paid enough. We were paid a fraction, nowhere near enough. It was uh, laughable. Even having said that, I had coworkers who liked to stop and watch everybody else do for them, and they expected other people to always bail them out because they weren't careful with their money. They expected other people to always take care of their physical needs because they weren't out and working and doing it themselves. Um, I had very few times. I, we used to have chapels where they would give testimonies and people say, I praise the Lord, I opened my school mailbox today. And I needed $500 to stay in classes. I opened my mailbox. There was $500 in cash in my mailbox. You know, that never happened to me in school. But I needed money and God provided uh, I knew Pastor Kinney, and it seemed like he always got a roof right when we needed it most. And so we worked for it, and God took care of us wonderfully that way. That's the point. And so Paul says, we, we worked hard. We didn't have to, but we did. Uh, we, didn't want, we did this with labor and hardship, night and day, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Uh, this is the same Paul uh, that says that... Um, the one who preaches the gospel should live off the proceeds of the gospel in 1 Corinthians 9.14. Uh, he goes long and loud saying, you've got to take care of the pastor, take good care of the pastor. But in the next breath, he says, well, listen, I worked while I was there. Part of this, understand, it was interesting. It came up in men's breakfast yesterday. They were in this exact same passage. And it pointed out and reminded me that in the Greek world in that day and in that age, work was not put on a good pedestal. Work was put way down low. If you had to do your own physical work, if you didn't have people for that, and you actually had to do your own work, that was a terrible thing in their culture at that time. They looked down on that. And so industriousness wasn't something that was part of their work ethic. Um, in our country, you know, we've historically had good work ethic, historically. Part of that was when we were an agricultural society. Uh, every place I've worked, it didn't take very long at all to find out who the farm boys were. Because the farm boys knew how to work, they delighted in work, and you didn't have to tell them what to do, they did it. Um, I worked in a, in a plastics plant, and it was amazing. Uh, the, the guys that did the most work were the farm boys, followed by the Bible college guys, followed by the immigrants from Laos that worked there, and uh, the rest of the guys, the city folk that worked in there, I don't think many of them ever wore up, worked up a blister. Uh, but work ethic, it, it's, a, it's on hard times, it's old stuff, but we need to think that way. Uh, he knew what was going on, verse 11, he had good intel. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. He says, we've heard this, we understand this to be true of you, that some of you aren't doing anything. You don't have a job. You don't have a job and you're not keeping yourself busy with things. You're not finding work to do. Um, and he says you've, you've degraded into being busybodies. You're worried about other people's business because you have too much time on your hands. 
Uh, and again, they became busybodies because of this. In their great amount of leisure time, they started to worry about other people's business. That's what a busybody is, somebody that gets nosy. Uh, somebody that has too much time on their hands starts thinking about other people's business and correcting them and worrying about them and, and being critical of them. And so there are two things that, that flow out of busybodyism. Do you notice I made up a word there? Spell check didn't like it at all. Busybodyism. It very often comes out in gossip. You have all this time in your hands and you're, you're at the water cooler, if you will, at the beauty shop, at the barber shop, because guys are as bad or worse than women. And you're hearing it and you're sharing it. And you put your nose in somebody else's business where it doesn't belong. And if that wasn't bad enough, your mouth follows after your nose and tells everybody else what you figured out. Or you have time to nitpick. Uh, I, I had a man that wanted to hire me to do some landscape timbers. It wasn't exactly my usual gig. Uh, if I have a job like that now, I call Gabe. Uh, but back in the day when I needed work, I was going to do it for him. And I was really, really wrestling in my mind with two different hourly rates, what I was going to charge the man for doing his work. And then he told me, I've taken the next two weeks off so I can watch everything you do. I chose my higher number, friend or no friend, because he had all that time on his hands to nitpick. And he didn't do any of it. So you know what I'm saying. It's, these things, they happen. It's a natural thing. There's no chapter and verse for the saying, idols, hands, or the devil's workshop. That was probably your grandma or somebody's grandma came up with that one. But isn't that the sense of this passage? Work. Work because God commands it. Work because life commands it. You need to eat. Work. Work because if you don't work, you're going to get in trouble. Laziness begets laziness. Busybodiness begets busybodiness. Gossip begets gossip. We need to be careful that we don't give ourselves too much time to get in trouble. We need to be industrious. We need to work. That's his point. Uh, he commands them in Jesus' name and authority. Uh, verse 12, Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. It's as simple as that. Work for it. Earn it. Eat it. And we have a very different economy. We have way more specialization. It's more about earning the money that we need to spend on things. We don't think most of us like farmers anymore. The farmer was good at everything because he or she had to be. They had to know how to fix it. They had to know how to grow it, etc. And so, you know, my, my great-grandfather that cut Little Pine Creek Farm uh, out of the woods of Pennsylvania, he understood this. And in the world that he grew up in, in the world that his sons, my... Uh, grandfather and his siblings grew up in, they understood that you worked for it. If you needed it, you made it. If it had to be fixed, you fixed it. If it had to be done, you were the doer. That was how it worked. And it's fine that we specialize. And it's fine that I have, maybe I have one thing that I'm good at. People typically look at me funny. I, had, I met somebody new this week who looked at me very funny. They knew I was a pastor. They were shocked to hear I'd been roofing. You know, oh, you do that? Yeah, you know, and it's funny how many pastors I know that do something hands-on on the side, and people say, why carpentry? Well, mostly because it's really, really flexible, and it's there. The other is it's very gratifying to look at something at the end of the day and see it as being done. We don't get to do that here. This gets measured over years, and there's so many things that I never find out at all about how God's using his word in you. Uh, so it's kind of nice to paint a wall and see it change colors and so forth. Um, but... Um, we can specialize all we want. We can do our one thing, but we need to do it well. We need to work hard. We need to avoid idleness. We need to avoid busybodyism. We need to avoid gossip because those are sneaky sins that take the, the believer over very quickly. And so he says these people are busybodies and gossips. Here's what they need. They need a J-O-B. They need to go to work. They need to earn it and need it. Just that simple. It's replaced by use of the opposite. One of the most profound verses I ever saw as a young man was Ephesians 4.28. Let him who stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing that is good so that he can have to give to him in need. So he doesn't just say, hey, quit stealing. He says, get a job, work hard, earn it, and give it away. What's the opposite of stealing? Earning it and giving it away. Replaced by use of the opposite. May I encourage you that too often... 
we take our unsaved worldly habits and we try to replace them with the closest Christianized version we can. We do that in our language choices. Uh, we, we do that in, in some things that we ingest. We do that in some things that we watch. We, we gotta be very careful that we're not just Christianizing worldliness. Replacing by use of the opposite is a pretty wonderful uh, pattern that scripture gives us. And that's what Paul gives here. Work for it and eat it. That's what you need to do. Uh, the command of the church at large, he says, verse 13, but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. Don't give up. Don't give up. Never, ever, ever give up. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. Um, I mentioned the bond my dad and his brother have largely because of their years in the ministry and the times that they cried on each other's shoulder over things that were going on in the ministry and how that knit them together. My dad and I have very much that relationship. I've known, I knew an older couple where they traded uh, Christmas and birthday cards back and forth between each other. They never signed them or put a date on them. They just kept giving them back and forth. It was a wonderful way to save money, by the way. Uh, maybe a little boring after a while, but uh, they would trade these things back. My dad and I would trade Galatians 6, 9 back and forth. I'd write him a note and I'd put that in to encourage him and he'd write me a note or send me a card. And to this day, he'll put Galatians 6, 9. Be not weary in well-doing, for in, good, in due season you will reap if you faint not. The only thing that keeps us from reaping the harvest is quitting too soon. Be not weary in doing good, for in due season we'll reap if we don't quit. We need to keep at it. Um, very quickly, because I am just right at it. Verse 14. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Uh, separation from the one who's in sin. Our friends roll, rub off on us. It's what they do. Uh, we need to preserve purity in Christ's church. We need to preserve purity in ourselves. We typically take on the flavor of the people we spend time with. So we need to think that way. Especially if it's a brother or sister in Christ and they're claiming Christ and they're not living like they have him in there. Uh, we are told in no uncertain terms in this passage and a couple others I've read today that we're to mark them and avoid them. And so here he says it again. But notice the attitude. It's the imperative of love. He says, let him feel his shame. And again, that's not punitive. I'm going to make you feel so bad for doing the bad thing. It's, I want you to feel bad because I want you to want to make it right with God. It's corrective. Galatians 6, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. It's not let them have it and beat them down. It's not discon you know, disconnect from them, cut them off forever. It's restore them. It's about restoration. And the imperative of love over all of it. He's not your enemy. Don't treat him like one. He's your brother. Your heart ought to break for a brother. You ought to want what's best for a brother. And so you don't treat him as an enemy, but you admonish him as a brother. Brother, won't you please do the right thing? It's a wonderful, powerful thing. I love you. You're my brother. I'm not over you. I'm not under you. I'm next to you. We're siblings in the Lord. I love you. You're my brother. I want what's best for you. Please won't you stop this and start what God wants you to do. And by the way, that's one of those places in a family. Sometimes a, a, a sibling can accomplish what mom and dad can't. In a church family, sometimes you all can accomplish with each other what I can't. Maybe there's things I don't know about. Maybe there's something where you've been through the same sin. And you can say, hey, I noticed something. I noticed you got caught up in or you seem to be heading towards can I tell you a little something about myself? That was my sin of choice. That sin tripped me up for years. It kept me away from God. It kept me away from His people. It hurt me. It hurt those around me. Please don't go there. Please come back from this edge that you're walking towards. Please, please the Lord. If you can do that and, and give a for example and say, I've been there and done that and I know, oh, that's powerful. I can give people the Word of God. The Spirit presses it into hearts. But boy, the Lord uses testimonies too. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Don't make him your enemy, but admonish him as your brother. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Uh, we pray that we would understand it, that we would live it. 
that we would each have a good work ethic, Lord, that we would not be undisciplined in our life, but, Lord, that we would uh, get done what we need to in a day, uh, that we would have good discipline in that regard, uh, that we would work, uh, Lord, uh, whether employed or not, that we would find something wholesome, something worthwhile, something needful to fill our day with, Lord, uh, that we'd be obedient to you in the work ethic that you call from us. Uh, help us, Lord, to teach a generation coming that things that are uh, worth having are worth earning and the satisfaction of, more, of earning something with our own hard work. And, uh, Lord, that you bless us in it and for it, that you would keep us true to your word. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. And now I have to find my closing song. Take time to be holy, and let's stand together as we sing. <clears throat> Take time to be holy, speak oft with thy Lord. Abide in Him always, and feed on His Word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing, His blessing to seek. Take time to be holy. The world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like Him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct, His likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, let him be thy guide, and run not before him, whatever be tied. In joy or in sorrow, still follow thy Lord, and looking to Jesus, us, still trust in his word.